I'm thinking the prefrontal cortex is some extra other place, but it's just an area of the frontal cortex. Is that a fair? Yeah, it's the form. It's the f the, the front, front most area of the cortex. So it's not like your oven, like there's a dial and then it says prefrontal cortex <laughs> and then full cortex and frontal cortex and then right yeah yeah it's it's the very front and and that area is is one of the areas that's very evolved in humans and yes seems to me part of what it is to be likable is you perceive that the other person cares about you in some way they'll ask about you and at some level that's empathy right the capacity to be even be able to do that yeah is that a is that a measurable thing in your brain? research empathy yes oh yeah yeah there's a lot of research on empathy i've done that's some of the research i've done myself at stanford is on empathy would war even be possible if everyone were empathetic i mean I, i'm just thinking of these things taken to extremes right the absence or existence it accounts for practically everything that disrupts society yeah you know i've i've actually i'm reading one of your books right now and you use the term goldilocks zone right to refer well, to it's, it's in the field the goldilocks zone. Yeah. yes but is the idea that it's in the perfect place right mm -hmm. it has to if, if for it planets. was planets yeah if yeah. the planet were any further from the sun we would have frozen lakes and yeah, if it yeah. were any closer we would burn up right that's how, kind of how i view empathy i think we have empathy in the goldilocks zone that if we had any more and we let's say for instance you saw you know i broke my finger and looking at my broken finger, you felt the full sensation of your finger being broken. That would be terrible. That's too much empathy, mm. yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. if you wanted to help me, you would have to like look away while you're like bandaging up my finger, right? It would just be too much. It's it's way more than is necessary to motivate you to support me, right? And that, by the way, is sort of the purpose of empathy, right? You could tell someone's hurt. You're like, oh gosh, you know, let me help. Yeah. Or if you see they're happy, it's it's a way to communicate emotions non-verbally. Empathy is also positive. But if you had no empathy, you saw my broken finger and you're like, who cares? Mm -hmm. You would have no motivation to support me or to help me, right? And so we are right That's in psychopathic this. psychopathic at, at, yeah, at the yeah. extreme limit of that. Right. And so Where humans. you harm someone and you don't even care that you harm them or feel any of the pain that they might experience. Right. And humans, on, in, on average, of course, there's a range of empathy. That's psychopath. Sociopath, I think. is uh, Psychopath. No, psychopath. Psychopath, is, is it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So humans on average, of course, there's a range. Most people fall into this range where we feel some empathy for other people, but it's not so much that we're totally taking on the full sensation. And what's important to, on the note of war is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that the brain sort of evolved to treat those in our in-group differently. Empathy is one of those things. We are, there's plenty of studies showing that people's brains, the brain areas that are associated with empathy, they will activate more for others that they view as in their in-group. And it doesn't really matter like really what that in-group is. It can be race, it could be religion, it could be political affiliation, you know, there's all sorts of things. And so when we see others as unlike us, and there's this concept of self-other overlap. If you picture two, like a Venn diagram, right? You're one circle, the other person is the other circle. How much of an overlap are those circles? The further apart those circles are, the less empathy you're gonna experience and the less activity in those empathy. The really easier it will be for you to kill them. Right, the, the less painful it will be for you to That's witness how I should have said it. them yes. struggling. Yes. Yeah, and so in war, this is a clear outgroup situation. With propaganda to even, that, to, that even feeds the separation of the Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Right, and what that does is it basically dehumanizes your brain's representation of that person, mm -hmm. that it doesn't respond, like I mentioned on social media, right? We, we don't see social cues, the brain says, I don't know if I'm interacting with a person, this could be a, this is a screen, right? If you can get you get a person to dissociate the human so far from themselves that they see nothing in common, then those empathy areas aren't going to come online and it's going to be easy to harm them. Mm -hmm. So then social media, does that add to the desensitization of empathy in others because you're not having a human to human interaction? There's this technology in between you? So I, we don't know that yet, but I published a paper on this couple years ago, I called it the virtual disengagement hypothesis. And what journal does those go in? So that journal is called Neuroscience. Oh, duh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, good journal title to publish. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. a little on the nose, but then. it felt like it was appropriate for the topic. Uh -huh. But yeah. And so this idea that my student Maria Tavares and I published is that when we are not experiencing these social cues online, there's no reason that the empathy areas in our brain should turn on. And so this could potentially mm. explain why there's such hostility online. I mean, Raise your hand if you've experienced harassment online. Hostility, I mean, my goodness. you know, would never happen one on one. You exactly. just know this. Exactly. Even with people with highly different views from you, it just degrades 
immediately. Yeah, and uh, by the way, there's you know there's a whole research field on this. It's called computer mediated communication. That's what they called it in the 80s before social media and all this came about. Mm. So when the computer came about, they started doing research where they would have people interact through computers, which is what we now do almost every day, yes. pretty much every day. And they found that people behave differently. They were more unfiltered. They would be swearing. They would be hostile. And, you know, that wasn't like the finding, but it was part of what they saw. And they didn't have an explanation for it. Because modern society likes to medicate things, are there good and bad medications that are being taken that will affect people's isolation or inclination to be more sociable? You mean drugs? <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. Sex. No, medication. Right. Sex. Sex. No, no, can't make uh, I just, I didn't know if you were talking about like behavioral interventions or like yeah. no, drugs. Two drugs, yeah. Yeah, like, okay, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's a lot of research on, and not very well-recognized research. I know, because I'm the one who did it. <laughs> Subject. Uh, <laughs> on how drugs influence the social brain. Yeah. And, you know, there's research, for instance, on painkillers, right? When you take a painkiller, we all know that painkillers, you know, this is over-the-counter stuff, can reduce our pain, obviously. Mm -hmm. But did you know it can also reduce your empathy for someone else's pain? So if you have painkillers in your system and you're Why asked, am I only learning about this now? Right. Because well, I only just asked the question. Because <laughs> Gary had a great question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it also reduces social pain, too, by the way, because there's, some, there's a significant overlap in the brain between physical pain and social pain, how it's processed. So if you take acetaminophen and someone insults you, you're not probably going to feel as bad. Really? Yeah. Mm. And can you take a bottle of acetaminophen? Does that does that help for for a com comedy uh, performance on stage? Drown out the hostile crowd. Really, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it on, bitches! I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna... So, and, and the other thing too is that you know not only does it reduce your social pain, but also the pain of others. So if you are on acetaminophen and you see someone who is socially excluded, for instance, from a group, you're probably going to feel less bad for them. It actually sort of blunts the brain's ability to turn on these areas, these brain areas that process and make us feel pain and, and the, the emotional component of pain, not the physical part. So when I was a kid, I wanted to be a superhero. I don't know if that's unusual or what, but I wanted to be a protector of the geeks because geeks back in my day, before geeks were the richest people in the world, they were completely abused by the football quarterback and get wedged up on the oh, thing. That's still happening. That's still happening. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm pretty no, sure but, that's still happening. But I was a little bit bigger than most people, and I was probably physically fit a year and a half before my chronological age. So I could kick your ass if I had to. But I was also a geek. So if I ever saw someone who was, or was under socialized getting abused, I it would be almost an irrational level of rage I would feel. And I want to just, this is where, where the superhero mm. feelings come in. I want to just jump in the middle of there and just pummel the person who's abusing one of my people, one, one of my geeks. The Incredible Nerd Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what you are in real life now, oh, though. <laughs> I guess this is protecting my tribe, I guess. It's still yet another step to want to harm someone who, I mean, I could just separate them, but I, I felt this urge to just do what the superheroes do to the bad guys. Yeah. You know? Well, you, yeah. I mean, that's, that's to entirely natural for a human being, right? You want to protect your group. Uh -huh. And sometimes that means eliminating the threat. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, that's very militaristic. Say eliminating the <laughs> threat. <laughs> yeah. We talked about. I was very Pete headset. <laughs> <of you. laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> mm. Optimum lethality. Mm. <laughs> so we've gone through painkillers and, and how they can affect. So what, what are the positive drugs? I mean, is it just alcohol is, or what else are we going to go to? Well, so I would actually argue that alcohol is not a positive that's drug. That's definitely not positive. I mean, it, it feels positive when you're, when you're consuming it. So it's short term. Yeah. So alcohol, it, it relieves anxiety. You know, mm. There's a study that showed that for every drink consumed, people show a 4% reduction in social anxiety. And, and actually, you know, the way alcohol works in the brain is it, it turns down the activity of neurons and it's done, it's been shown to do so specifically in the amygdala, this emotional... Fight or flight. When yeah. you say drink, you mean like the, the classical drink, so yeah. a shot, a glass right. of wine, a bottle of beer, 4% is not much. But if you have five of them, <laughs> yeah. now, we're now, talking, we're now we're talking 20%. 20 yeah. down. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Um, and and at so, the, and the same time, does it lower inhibition as well? Alcohol makes your brain cells better at turning each other's activity down. 
Gotcha. And so what happens is what your brain's normally doing that all the time, the brain cell acti- or the activity of your brain goes down. And when this happens in, say, the prefrontal cortex, normally a lot of your behavioral inhibitions stem from the prefrontal cortex. You might get an urge to, you know, lean over and kiss someone or right. start a fight, and your prefrontal cortex is like, that's not a good idea. Let's not do that. Oh. But those higher level processing areas, their activity is going down, and so they're not quite as effective at shutting down those impulses. So it's not just, are you more sociable? Are you more likely to get into a fight? Yes. And Both of those can happen here. Mm. Right, exactly. That's why I argue that it actually makes us less effective interactors. It reduces social anxiety. It reduces how much distress we gotcha. feel in interactions. But what that also means is that, for instance, when people are shown negative social cues in research labs and they're given alcohol, their amygdala responds less. So they show less of an emotional reaction to negative social cues. So now let's think about putting that in the context of a bar. You go to kiss someone. They're showing you a face that tells you, don't kiss me. Your amygdala is not saying, this is bad. You you want it. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) You can't resist this. Give us a kiss. You are failing to process, properly interpret their emotional cues, right? Or you try to, you know, whatever. You, you say a really inappropriate joke, and it doesn't land, and it's insulting, and you hurt someone's feelings. You're much more likely to brush it off, where you just actually did something damaging to a relationship. Right. And so, I, you know, it may make us feel less, but it probably actually makes us act worse because we could become less considerate of others' emotions. Thank you.